Hello, today we're going to talk about chapter 12, Experiments and Observational Studies. So the book starts off by saying, um, by explaining a study between music students versus non-music students, and they noticed that there was a, um, there was a difference in their GPA, a significant difference, I would say, and 16% of those kids had all A's versus only 5%. So clearly that means that students should do more music, right? They should be definitely enrolled in some type of music, okay? But does that really provide solid evidence, okay? Is there other explanations, right? Maybe kids who do music are more disciplined, okay? Since they have to follow disciplines for music, they follow that through their academics, vice versa. Um, is there really a way to prove that? And that's what we're going to talk about in this lesson. So how can we prove that our experiments or observations are valid? Okay. So, and what is an observational study? An observation is you don't assign choices. You're just watching. Okay. You are just, you are looking through a window and recording what you see. Okay. So in the wild. Okay, Retrospect, retrospective is um, collecting data on old stuff. Okay, so your old grades, things that have already happened. Perspective is, okay, I wanna look at these things and now I'm gonna watch these people and see what happens. Okay, so why do observational studies? Well, they're, they're good to find out something or find trends okay or, or see if there's a relationship okay um, it's kind of like well what do I need to study I don't know let's go look in the world and see what's out there okay no matter what you do though all right what, whatever observational study you do you cannot say that it's a causal relationship all right correlation does not equal causation right that's not happening in here observation studies are never never going to demonstrate a causal relationship, all right? There's too many underlying variables that you don't know what's going on, okay? So it's an, you cannot say that, okay? Okay, so let's do an example. So a larger than usual number of cats and dogs developed kidney disease. So they didn't know why, so they had to observe it and see what happens. Okay, so how do we find out if these cats and dogs are getting kidney disease? Well, I would probably do a retrospective, right? I don't want to do all dogs and cats. I just want to see those that got sick and see what happened. So just looking at those that got sick, we can look at and just kind of see what kind of relationship there might be among those dogs and cats. Okay, so now let's go to experiments. Experiments let us prove cause and effect, okay? So yes, we like experiments because that means we are taking control of things, okay? So we have a factor, all right? So one variable and we, um, we are trying to manipulate it and at least one response variable, okay? So we're trying to see, um, trying to get a certain response, okay? So we manipulate a factor and then it'll have, um, it'll create treatments. You'll see what that is in just a minute. You'll randomly assign those subjects to those different levels and then compare the responses. Okay. We call the individuals um, experimental units. When humans are involved, we call them subjects or participants. Okay. Um, we don't usually call people experimental units. It kind of sounds... Um, I don't know. I, I, yeah, it just doesn't sound human, right? I don't know. I don't, personal is what I'm trying to get at. Okay. Um, the specific values that the experimenter chooses. Um, okay. Um, let's do an example so you guys can see what a treatment and what those levels are. Okay. Um, Okay, so, sorry, I just had to go find this image. I think this will make it easier to see. 
So if I wanted to see how the oven affected the outcome of my cake, right? See if it tasted better, okay? One of my factors could be the oven setting um, and then different levels of the temperature. Okay, so baking it at 300, 325, 350, 375, probably wouldn't go higher than that, but maybe 400 <laughs> for a very, very small amount. Um, let's see. Okay, so your treatment would be a combination. So let's say you were doing, you had several factors going on. So with different levels, um, different, different amounts of sugar, flour, and eggs. So maybe one treatment would be the oven at 300, the sugar, half what they recommended, flour, the same, you know, one cup, I don't know, and then one egg. Okay, and then it, see what the outcome is. Okay. So the experimenter controls those factors and they want to control every detail, anything that might change the outcome of my cake, right? I didn't just look at the oven. I looked at the sugar, the flour, the eggs, everything. Okay. And it assigns, the experimenter always assigns the subjects at random. That's very important. Okay, why can't they choose their own treatment? Because who would want to get the, um, let me, so hold on, my cake example's not going to do. Okay, what if you're testing, um, what did the book use one time? Fertilizer? So if you're testing fertilizer, um, well, if the plants could choose, they wouldn't choose to not get the fertilizer, Right everybody would all the plants would want to get the fertilizer so think of it like that um i know that's a really silly example but you know what i'm trying to say hopefully if not ask me a class i'll come up with something better <laughs> um all right so um it has to be at random and then they observe the response variable all right so then they compare all those different responses and then they look for a change right a difference or similarity. I guess it depends on your question. Okay, so let's do an example. So back to our kidney disease. We're going to go keep going back to this just so you know. So now they're saying that they tested it. The new food is safe. Okay, let's make sure. So how do we test it? Okay, well, I would give some dogs the new food and some dogs I guess what you would deem healthy. Okay, what well, was safe? So either something I would prepare or something from the lab. All right, so then the response, oh, I'm sorry, what would the response be? Would be the health of the animal. Obviously done by a veterinarian, not by me. I can't do that. <laughs> All right, so make sure it's clear how you're getting the info. Okay, so there are four major principles of experimental design. So the first one is you got to control all your factors. Okay, so think about anything that might affect it or might affect your response and adjust for it. Okay, then number two, you want to randomize. That is super duper important. Okay, this helps us um, not have to worry about these unknown or uncontrollable sources. Okay, these unknown things, because if everybody's random, then there shouldn't be any underlying things. Okay, obviously this doesn't eliminate it 100%, but makes it better. Um, without this, it's not a valid experiment and will be useless. Okay, so it needs to be random. Okay, step number three, I'm sorry, principle number three is you got to replicate it. Okay, doing, seeing what happens with just one plant or with one animal or with one person, one unit, okay, it's an anecdote, not data, very, very different, okay, just having one piece of information doesn't, doesn't give you anything, you can't apply that to the population, that could have been a special case. So if it's, if your experimental group isn't representative of the population of interest, Okay, then it's, um, 
you, you got to start replicating for different groups and different situations. And maybe this is why you've seen when you research things, it's hard necessarily to find exactly what you're looking for. Okay. Um, unfortunately, a lot of data out there is specifically for, uh, you know, if we're talking on humans, it's specifically on, um, well, this could get debatable here. Okay. Um, either way. Okay. So the fourth principle is, um, to block. Okay. So sometimes we're studying, we can't control, um, parts of the outcome. So what we do is we just go ahead and block them together. Um, so if some groups are similar, we could do it by race or gender or some other arbitrary thing. And then, um, and then randomize within each of those blocks. Okay. It's, it's when you can't necessarily get rid of, um, or taking, or it's basically another way of taking into consideration other factors that might affect your response. Okay. So that's why we would block. You don't always, you don't have to though. Okay. So back to our, um, pet dog food or whatever, pet food. We're back to that example. So we need to, um, we're going to do an experiment, right? See if the food is safe. So how will we do, how will we implement control randomization and replication? Okay. This is not a simple answer. Okay. This is not a one sentence and done. Okay. There's a lot of things you need to take into consideration and you need to explain. So one way to do this experiment is you control the portion size. Okay. To reduce variability from other factors than food, you can standardize their environment. You right? Wouldn't housing, um, you know, where the pets are sleeping and how much water exercise play all that time. Wouldn't that also affect their health? All right. Not just food affects their health. Okay. So you might want that to be the same. All right. We might also want to do a single breed of dog. Okay. And maybe just do adult dogs so that we were, we're not looking at, um, you know, other things that could affect it, right? It could be different to puppies. Okay. It could be different from a bulldog to a lab. Okay. Um, you got to assign randomly, right? So we, dog's health, we don't know beforehand. Okay. Any underlying, um, conditions, what I'm saying. Um, let's see, obviously you'd want to do one, one, more than one dog to each treatment. So you need to get a lot of dogs into this, um, experiment. Um, yeah. And if you had time and funding, you'd just keep repeating it. Okay. So replicate it into more, um, options. Okay. All right. Diagrams are super helpful when looking at experiments. Okay. It's, it's always starts with your random, you get your two groups and then there are different types of treatments. Okay. So, um, these are usually what your diagrams are going to look like. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So this was the fertilizer example. Okay. So we want to make better tomatoes. Okay. So how, how do we make that experiment? Well, the experiment we could design is want something like this. Okay. You have 24 plants from a garden. Then you have three different groups. One treatment is the control group. Second treatment gets half the dose. Third treatment gets full fertilizer. All right. Cause maybe you just think maybe they're over exaggerating. Maybe I can just use a little bit and I really don't need all that fertilizer. Right? You're trying to cut corners. Okay. It's always good to see if there's a change. Okay. So how different do they need to be? Right. That's debatable. Right. Right. Uh, we're going to talk about, not really debatable. It's, we'll talk more about statistical significance later. 
Okay. But for now, we just say that it's significant. <laughs> we say it's statistically significant if it didn't, um, if it wasn't likely to occur by chance. Okay. So obviously cute little comic. Enjoy. Um, <laughs> it's nice to laugh every now and then. Um, okay. So statistically significant. Want to understand. Okay, so experiments and samples are actually um, very similar. Okay, so they use randomization to get unbiased data, and that's what we like, unbiased data. However, sample surveys try to estimate population, so the sample needs to represent the population. Okay, experiments are looking at the effectiveness of things, effectiveness of treatments. And the units aren't always drawn from um, a random population, right? Think about if I'm experimenting on a new cancer drug. I may do locally, right, in Florida, but I'm not going to randomly pick people from, um, you know, Seattle, okay? That's, um, I wouldn't randomly pick cancer patients. I would pick the ones that would come to me. That would be an experiment. Does that make more sense, hopefully? Okay, so when we, when we design an experiment, we always wanna make sure we have a control treatment. So when we, um, that's basically your status quo, the business as usual, the, the baseline, okay? Your control is the, um, the real world, okay? Okay, so how to avoid bias in an experiment? One thing is blinding, okay? Um, so how do we basically, blinding them is where they don't know what treatment's getting what, okay? So like if you were studying a new drug and you had, um, you know, drug A and drug B, you wouldn't know uh, which drug you were getting. You just were told you were getting a drug to help you with your cancer, okay? The, um, so that would be blinding, would be like you're literally blinding me to what's actually happening, okay? You're just giving me the, the little bit. So there's two types of people that can affect your outcome and those who can influence the results and those who evaluate the results. So not only the person taking the drug, but also those that, um, that evaluate the patient at the end, okay? If the doctor says no, that you have drug A and that doctor likes drug A, then they're gonna think that they, you are doing better than those on drug B, okay? It's just that inherent bias we have. We can't help it, we're human. We yeah, that's just who we are. So when, and either one, so if either you blind the person um, that's getting the treatment or those that are evaluating the results, that's a single blind study. But usually we call it a double blind study because that's more often the case, okay? Especially when it comes to the medical world, okay? All right. Okay, so back to our food, our dog food example. All right, so we're feeding um, one group the new food and one group the safe food. So should the vet be blinded? What do you think? Hopefully yes, okay? Whenever it involves judgment, it's always a good idea to blind, okay? Um, again, People are biased, and we just can't help it. So can this experiment be double blind? Well, I know you're probably thinking, well, a dog obviously doesn't know if, what it's getting, so of course it's blinded already by um, knowing the, which um, place it's at. But come on, we don't, we, don't, we don't collect dogs. We collect dogs and their owners. So yes, the owners and the workers who care and feed for the animals should not be aware of the dog food and which dogs are getting which because they might be treated differently, right? If they're not getting the good dog food, maybe they're, 
you know, people are going to be like, oh, well, they need more exercising to, you know, um, counter for that. Okay. So again, people biased. So placebos, all right, because people are, can believe anything. Okay. So we usually do a control treatment that mimics the treatment itself. So hence, um, kind of like your, your fake treatment, um, with the dog food, you had safe food and real dog or the new dog food. All right. So that, that fake treatment is the placebo, like the, um, like, especially if you want to see if a cancer drug is helping. Okay. You don't want to not give it to patients because then they know they're not getting the drug right? And that can lower their morale, which then can influence their treatment. So um, that's why we do things like a with a placebo. Okay, that's like a fake thing. It's um, and honestly, sometimes there's a placebo effect where just because you think it's supposed to help you, it starts making you feel better. Okay. Um, It's, it is what it is. Um, Especially if you have a, um, a mental issue, all right, the placebo effect could, could really affect you. Um, sorry, I'm just thinking about my mother. She would ask for, um, a pain pill and I would give her an Advil and she would feel a million times better. Okay. Um, just because she thought she was getting something stronger. Okay. Um, that's, that's the placebo effect. Okay. All right. So this is why it's really important to blind, um, your variables. All right. All right. Blind, um, blind your subjects because this placebo effect could happen. All right. The best experiments. Okay. If you're trying to make the best one, you're going to randomize it make it comparative. Okay. Compare things in it. Right. Um, lots of different levels, double blind and it's placebo controlled. Okay. That's your best option for an experiment. All right. So blocking, we want to do blocking when, um, when the units are similar. Okay. So we put them into sections. Okay. Um, so here you can see that we've blocked them by based on the stores. So this comes from store a, and this comes from store B. Okay. So that would be blocking them. And then notice that they did random assignment between those 12 random assignment between those six, and then did different controls. Um, I'm sorry, different treatments, Um, the three different treatments for both blocks. Ooh, got to get my words right. All right. So, um, okay. So more about blocking, um, in a retrospective or perspective study. So observational study, you can match the subjects, um, in the, in much the same way as blocking. Okay. So blocking is for experiments as stratifying is for sampling. Okay. It's just, it's just a way of grouping them. Okay. Um, and then you randomize within those and that removes your variation. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're usually just testing the effects of the factors, not usually the effects of each individual block. Okay. So you're just looking at the end. Okay. So back to our dog food. All right. Um, well in the study, it put both cats and dogs at risk. So our study should probably test on both animals. So why can't we just randomly assign them to both groups? Okay. Why can't we do that? Well, they might respond differently to the different foods. Okay. And that very variability could obscure my results. What I mean by that is if I just do a random assignment, 
there's a chance all my cats can get the new food and all the dogs get the um, the lab food, which means that very that difference could just be in the difference in the animals. Okay. All right. I know it's unlikely, but you want to make sure that's not an issue, right? Right. H how do you know if you've got an unbalanced amount, right? So that's why you block things. So what should we do instead? Well, I just said it. <laughs> You'd randomize cats to the two treatments separately from the dogs. Okay. All right, it's also helpful to add more factors just to ensure that your, um, your treatment's really showing um, an improvement or not, what, showing what you want it to show, okay? So what I mean by that is extra factors is that notice this one is going to get control, no water, half dose, no water, full dose, no water. This one's going to get control and water, half dose water, full dose water, all right? It's adjusting for different factors. That's why having a diagram really helps lay things out, okay? All right, confounding variable. When the levels of one factor are associated with the levels of another factor, they're confounded. So you just can't... You can't separate out the effect, the effects of one from the other. Okay, um, you know the how do I put this? Um, well, that's why I have an example right here. So in the pet food experiment, all right, um, we gave the new food to the dogs and the safe food to the cats. How is that example of confounding? Well, I just told you that example, okay, <laughs> or why, <laughs> all right? Um, we would not be able to tell whether the difference in animals were attributed to the food or to the two species, okay? That <laughs> I said that example too early, I guess, in that last slide. So if you gave um, the dogs all one food and the cats all the other food, that's the problem. That's confounding, where you can't separate what the difference is. Okay, so that's, you don't want to have that as a problem. So always, always have like extra factors. Look for those things. Okay, so a lurking variable creates an association, all right, that makes us think that there's a relationship. Okay, so um, you're going to like this. Ice cream sales seem to be related to shark attacks, right? The more ice cream I sell, the more shack, short, blah, blah, blah shark attacks there are okay that seems to be the relationship right so that we can see that um sometimes in a an observational study okay so the lurking variable here is ooh, gotta move this is actually the weather right okay weather is what's causing the increase in ice cream sales and the increase in shark attacks. Really, ice cream and shark attacks have nothing related to each other, right? However, there, it, it may appear that there's a relationship, okay? So that's a lurking variable. We always want to be um, careful and try to look out for those, all right? It may be hard to see. So confounding, confounding can um, arise in experiments, okay? Um, since the experimenter assigns treatments at random, um, a confounding variable can't be thought of as a causing that assignment, okay? Um, let's see. Again, the confounding was when we had... Um, you know, all the cats had one food, all the dogs had the other food. That was confounding. All right, so we just can't tell whether it was by the factor or um, what that effect was caused by. So there's not no cause or effect here. So what could go wrong? Okay, don't give up because you can't run an experiment. Okay, so oftentimes just start with an observational study just to see just to see if there's a relationship, right? See if there's any kind of trend. Okay, 
beware of confounding. Okay, you don't, you gotta use randomiz randomization. It's a super duper important part. You have to be specific in statistics and explain what you're doing using your whole sentences and everything. <laughs> All right, um, bad things can happen even to good experiments. So protect yourself by recording additional information. Always, always add more info, okay? Don't spend your entire budget on the first run. Try a pilot experiment. Okay, just to kind of test the waters and see what's going on, right? See if there's any issues with um, your questionnaire, your survey, your whatever, okay? Your lab food <laughs> for the dog food, okay? Always, um, always test it first, okay? It's cheaper. All right, so this is, my goodness, everything you've learned, um, Hopefully this sums up chapter 12. If you've got any questions, you can see me in class or message me on your mind.